Hey everyone, good evening and welcome to today's stream. And today we are going to be chatting a little bit about some D&D stuff again. And we will be taking a good look at Fizzburn's Treasury of Dragons, which just released a couple of days ago. And we are quite excited to get a good look into the content in this book because we are going to be using that for some of our new characters coming up for um, Adventures League as well. And also for some of the stories that we're going to be telling as well because there are a veritable number of dragons in there and these are really, really exciting. Lots of dragons from back in the day that I w I'm kind of familiar with and... Um, I really, really love gem dragons being a good example. So, well, it's D&D, right? So D&D is all about dungeons and dragons, and you can't never separate the two. So if we want to talk about it, there have been quite a few books in the past that have been published about, um, you know, these iconic monsters. Um, there was Council of Worms in 2nd edition, there was the Dragonomicon from 3rd edition, and now we have Fizzbun's Treasury, which uh, pretty much re you know, brings back a good number of popular dragons, dragons, you know, um, dragon types, dragon um, species. And there's also a good healthy amount of content about, you know, classes and uh, races related to dragons as well and, and i'm really excited to delve into that on stream tonight and if you have just joined us you might have also noticed that we're doing things a little different on stream today we have uh some lights that we recently brought into the studio and as you can see um things are looking a little bit more shiny in the background and that's something that we're trying for today's stream and it might become a permanent fixture so, so I guess it gives us a little bit more of a of the gamer vibe, I suppose. And yeah, it's just liven things up a little bit. So, so yeah. All right. So shall we start delving into into Fizzbands just to get things going? Let me just pull that up, and here we go. So we have something in the back here that this is the cover for fist bands so as you can see these are some really awesome uh artwork here with the with the dragons fighting on the cover and you can see some adventurers off to the side hapless adventurers that are caught in the struggle and, and it's great so some of the dragons in fist bands are looking really really awesome as you can see and we are going to be peeking into them as we go along so what does this mean for adventurous league well in adventurous league fizzburn is definitely going to be one of the books that you can use um, to help uh, you know to build your character so some of the character options and spells in here are going to be a great addition to your repertoire if you're going to build something that has a more draconic vibe or a more uh, i suppose a more uh, dragon themed character right so we're going to just take a look at the content on dnt beyond right now so these are some of the things that you will be able to pick up in fizz bands when you when you pick it up so in so i guess in singapore one of the challenges is getting our hands on fizz bands in a, in time so it's been a little tough and uh we haven't been able to grab a physical copy of fizz bands yet but fortunately we have uh, D and D Beyond, and we have all the content in our account, so that's great. So, this is just a quick look at the um the co the table of contents, and you can see there's a nice disclaimer here: no guarantee is made that this book was or was not removed from the hoard of a dragon. Be aware that items taken from a dragon's hoard might carry traces of the dragon's inherent magic even long after they are removed from said horde. Exposure to another dragon's horde can reawaken that magic with unpredictable results. So this is a nice bit of flavor here. I really like that. And um, yeah, so let's start delving into some of the things that you as an Adventurous League player might be able to uh, enjoy with uh, Fizzbands. And that is going to be under character creation. So we're going to just take a look at that first. 
And the three main things that you're going to be looking at are, you know, uh, Dragonborn subtypes. <clears throat> so let's just quickly pop into that. So we're not going to look too much at that, but you know, you can see some, there's some really cool art that you'll be able to see if you buy the physical book as well. Um, and this is really cool. And this is actually pretty familiar. Where have I seen this art before? Was this in, uh, was this in the AFR set for Magic? It, it kind of looks like it. Could be one. Could be the Cell Sword in uh, the red card that costs like four, uh, four mana. So it it does look kind of familiar. And there are some varieties of uh, Dragonborn here that might be interesting. And these are definitely a big step up from the uh, rank and file Dragonborn that you might see in the player's handbook. So you get to you, to pick out your traits as when uh, you know either a chromatic dragonborn, which means that you come from one of the one of the five uh, five chromatic flights, the one the red, uh, blue, black, white, and green dragons, and you get to keep your you get to keep your breath weapon, of course. Um, you get your resistance, and you get this ability called chromatic warding, which is nice. And uh, this makes you immune to damage type, which is great. And it's a long rest ability. So this is actually much better than the, the default Dragonborn, I, I would say, because you just get resistance. Yeah, and of course, there's Gem Dragons. Uh, Gem Dragonborn are actually one of my favorites. Uh, I really loved the way they did Gem Dragons in 2nd edition and later. And um, these are the more psychic, uh, you know, Dragonborn, psychic dragons. Um, there's a lot more lore to them as well, and you can find that lore in later chapters of this book. And I'm not going to delve too much into that because I think it'll be great if you if you got a chance to pick up the book yourselves as well. And for the gem dragons, you you get you get some pretty cool uh, abilities. You get psionic mind, which is a you know telepathy, which is which is pretty nice. And this is great. Uh, you also get a ability to fly at fifth level, which is nice as well because. Um, at level 5 and up, being able to fly, having some movement abilities, movement skills is definitely beneficial, right? And not only does this give you flying speed equal to your walking speed, but you can also hover. And, you know, being able to hover is really, really important, um, even though you can only use this once every long rest. Uh, this is pretty decent overall. And if you take a look at the kind of damage type that gem dragons deal, they're one of the few... Uh, types of dragons that do certain uh, rare damage types, like force damage or radiant damage or psychic damage. So this is nice as well. So this is really, really good uh, if you are looking into that, uh, if you're trying to build for some better utility. And this is super cool. Yeah, so they are really nice because the rare damage resistance is, su is super helpful. Like imagine if you were an Amethyst Dragonborn and someone were going to you know, lob some magic missiles or Eldritch Blast in your direction. Um, and you were resistant to that. So that's really helpful. That's really fun. And that makes a big difference as well uh, at higher tiers of combat. Or in higher tier adventures when you're exposed to the more uncommon damage types. So that's really good. And of course, Metallic Dragonborn are so much more powerful here. And I would say that they have a lot more utility in terms of their breath weapons and abilities. So if you take a quick look at that, um, they have some great um, synergistic breath weapon alternatives. So there's the enervating breath, which is really strong because it causes incap, uh, incapacitated. It's a really, really uh, strong debuff. It's a really good uh, status effect. And this is a constitution save, but this is really helpful if you're dealing with like, uh, you know, a, a big number of mooks, or perhaps if you're dealing with some spellcasters and you manage to grab them, and you know, in a in a cone effect, and you were able to just brief on them, and this this could really turn the tables on a low level, low tier kind of adventure. So this is pretty good, um, like you know, at early tier two perhaps. So this is the this is your extra breath weapon. Which is which is one of these or repulsion is not the worst. Um, the main thing you want to look at is strength saving throw. Uh, knocks back for twenty feet and uh, knocks people prone. 
Uh, of course, you can't use this more than once every long rest, but nonetheless, this extra um, breath weapon effect can really turn the tables. Um, there's some good crowd control options here as well. So these are generally good. And they kind of synergize really well if you were playing kind of like a melee Dragonborn character. Um, perhaps, you know, if you were a Dragonborn Paladin, um, knocking them prone or making them incapacitated really opens up your options for if you were going to hit them in melee with a melee weapon and smite them as well. So, so there's some good synergies here. Yeah, and uh, considering the fact that this is based off your constitution modifier for the, for the save DC, um, and if you were playing a melee class, generally you want to have a higher constitution score, uh, everything kind of, kind of falls into place. Let's just say. So these are some of the, these are some of the dragonborn uh, race options that you get in fist bands, and I think that they're really good. Um, so that's that. What do you think so far? What do you think of what do you think of what you have seen, uh, in terms of the rare, uh, you know, the rarer kind of kind of uh, options so far? I, I really like them. And I'm already thinking about how I would maybe build an Emerald Dragonborn. Especially with the Psychic Damage. Uh, it also kind of fits the whole concept of a uh, maybe a, a more Psychic Mage, Psychic uh, Magic User type character. Uh, maybe a Dragonborn Ascetic. Someone who, someone who develops their, uh, their mental abilities, uh, like, you know, relying on spells that deal psychic damage or uses uh, telekinesis or whatever, right? So, and you can actually take that together with some of the feats from Tasha's that might work together with that as well. So this could be quite an interesting combination. Yeah, so this is something that I'm definitely looking into. I uh, really like the gem Dragonborn concept. Um, Topaz Dragonborn is kind of cool as well. So this is the this is the one that has a disintegrating breath attack by default in terms of in, in you know in their stat blocks and their stories. So this is something fun and uh, might be interesting to do as well. So depending on what happens. Um, so now that we have this, now that we've taken a quick look at this, I'm gonna just pop over to the subclass options. So there are two subclass options here in Fizzbands, and these are both options that are available to you if you are playing in Adventurous League. And one of them is for the monk, and the other is for the ranger, as you can see, so over here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the monk first, yeah. Because as far as we know, monks are, let's just say, not the strongest in terms of... Uh, their class abilities and most of the subclasses for monks are they, well they're not fantastic um, and I was really hoping when I first saw the way of the ascended dragon uh, in the unearthed arcana uh, column that you know they might be a good addition to the pool that they might be one of the better setups for monks but unfortunately, I don't think with uh, I don't think that they made it to fizz bands, you know, um, after being tuned down. It's not so good. Yeah. So, so looking at things right now. Um, oh, hey, we have a we have a um, a spam bot on our on our stream chat right now. So let's try to get rid of that. Uh, in the meantime. Before before we get back to talking a little bit about the monk, so give me a sec.
let's see if I can just get rid of this guy from the stream chat before we continue. Mm -hmm. There we go. Great. So, yeah, so where was I? Um, the monk. Um, the Way of the Ascendant Dragon um, definitely didn't make it to the to the final iteration intact there I think and I think we can as we just scroll down through the list you can kind of tell that um, there's been a little bit of a I, I guess there's been a little bit of a nerf all in all so let's take a look at the level 3 abilities first so uh, and I'll just kind of go through them and talk a little bit about about um, you know how they how, how it looks like uh, Fizban was the Fizban was the kooky old wizard in Dragonlance the one that had the, the one that was muddle-headed and uh, kept messing up his spells but he was really he was really Bahamut um, the, the the platinum dragon he's a, he's a god of the chromatic uh, of the uh, of the metallic dragons, while uh, Tiamat is the uh, the goddess of the uh, chromatic dragons, the, the mother of the chromatic flights. So this is so this concept, these stories are actually a very very integral part of uh, you know of D and D, and they are I guess a world building. So so they feature quite a bit here in uh, Fizban's treasury as well. So now let's take a look at the Draconic Disciple ability uh, third level feature. So you get Draconic Presence, and this is a this is a an ability that helps you to reroll essentially your uh, Intimidation and Persuasion checks, and this isn't too bad. Well, you get to use it once every long rest essentially, and the one thing here that isn't the worst, which I think is kind of helpful, is Draconic Strike. And you can change the damage type to um, essentially an energy type. So acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. I would have and I would have appreciated it a little bit more if you were able to change them into the rarer damage types as well. But I suppose um, the more common damage types here are being used because of uh, general balance reasons. Yeah, and on this list. Obviously, the one that's the most effective, uh, the one that's the least resisted, is Acid. So you probably want to use your Acid Draconic Strike more often than not. Because Cold, Fire, Lightning, and Poison are fairly easy to resist. There might be some synergies, and I'll talk about that later on, um, when we talk, when we cover a little bit about multi-classing, but that's something for that's that's something for later. Uh, Tongue of the Dragons is not bad because it gives you a um a somewhat common but also uh flavorful language. Draconic is a language that you don't normally pick up unless you are a spellcaster. So this is actually kind of helpful. Um, good for if you were doing. Uh, an adventure that involves some sort of magic or spellcasting and just happens that there are glyphs written on the wall in Draconic. So that's something you can read. And that gives you a bit of effectiveness and a bit of usefulness as a monk um, who's just not punching and stunning people. Right, so that's not too bad. Um, Breath of the Dragon is a fairly reasonable ability, I would say, um, when you attack. You can replace one of the attacks with draconic energy in a 20 foot cone or a 30 foot line that is five foot wide so so this is kind of like you know uh, projecting an energy blast kind of so this is maybe dragon kung fu right so it's a dexterity save against your key save dc so that's scales of your wisdom um damage of the chosen type Two rolls of your martial arts die, and of course your martial arts die is gonna be terrible at lower levels. So this is nowhere near as good as you know just burning a spell slot to cast your burning hands. But the benefit is that you can use this a fair number of times. 
So you get to use it equal to your proficiency bonus, and um, you can spend two key points. I think two key points is a bit much, because at eleventh level, uh, eleventh uh, level, you get to roll your martial arts die three times for damage, and that doesn't, you know, that's not a whole lot either. So certainly not the best, and. I'm not too fond of this, especially the fact that, you know, if you want to recharge and use this ability, you can you have to spend two key points as opposed to maybe one. One would be a lot more fair, considering how monks are just not that fantastic as damage dealers, right? Wings Unfold gives you essentially a flying speed equal to your walking speed, which is not too bad because monks have a pretty good speed uh, increment all in all, right? And... You don't get the ability to recharge this, and that is a bit sad. But having it equal to a number of times, uh, you know, equal to your proficiency bonus is not the worst. So at higher levels, you could probably fly while you use your step of the wind. Uh, no, up to six times, which is not terrible. But at that point in time, you should probably have a you know like a winged boots or or some other ability to fly you know in built anyway because. Uh, you would have some good magic items by then, right? Um, especially since it's at higher levels. And in AL, you do get your pick of magic items. And you can bring up to 10 items at higher tiers, uh, at, you know, tier 4 to your table. So, so you would probably have something that gives you inbuilt flying speed already. But at low levels, at level 6, um, you know, in tier 2, when you first get this, the ability to fly may not be the worst. It's just that I don't fancy how um, you don't get to use this, uh, you don't get to recharge this by spending key points, which would have been nice. Because, um, you know, you would expect someone else to have maybe come into the adventure with a broom of flying already. Uh, perhaps because they played who's there and, you know, they picked up so bad stuff of flying. So that, that would have been, that would be something that you kind of expect in um, Tier 2 in Adventurous League and... While I don't think that you should necessarily be overly reliant on items, um, it's nonetheless a good backup. So this is kind of okay if you don't get access to flying items, but it could definitely afford to be a better. Uh, it could definitely afford to have key point recharge uh, ability perhaps. But but let's move on. And this is definitely a this is definitely a card uh, art from Magic the Gathering from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. I clearly remember this. Uh, yeah, so so that's pretty that's pretty cool. I see you can see that they are kind of using all the art from AFR uh, from the from the Magic Gathering set uh, you know, in this books as well. Yeah, aspect of the worm. The draconic aura feels terribly small, ten feet for one minute. That's not the best. I vaguely recall that in UA this was bigger, and. So, so this kind of got the nerf as well. So, I I suppose so far everything you've seen, they kind of it kind of got hit by the nerf bat, or maybe they thought that you know dragon the dragon uh, aspected monk you know is is too powerful. So who knows, right? Uh, frightful presence isn't the worst. Frightened condition is reasonably decent because it you know it it, it causes disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls, right? So. While they cannot move closer to you, you can move closer to them and you can beat them up. So, so that's actually not the worst. It's a good um, general area-based you know, control ability on a monk. So that's not terrible. The resistance aura, it's, it's a limited pool of energy types that you can be resistant to and damage types that you can be resistant to. And I don't think that it's all that helpful, but nonetheless, if you are facing a lot of spellcasters and you being able to pick on the fly, this is possibly useful, especially if you're also huddling up with a paladin. And of course, you get to spend some key points to recharge that, so I guess, you know, that's not the worst. Um, could be better. <laughs> and now let's take a look at Ascendant Spirit. Uh, or Ascendant Aspect. Ascendant Spirit was a Magic the Gathering card or something. Just got that mixed up. Um, yeah, Augment Breath. 
So you, you can spend a key point to change the uh, the effect to either be a cone that's 60 foot wide or 90 foot long. So, so that's pretty decent. And the damage scales up by one more die to four rolls of your martial arts die. So at level 17 plus plus plus, I guess you're doing 4d 10-ish damage. So that's about 22 points on average. Uh, it's a minuscule amount at tier 4. Let's face it. Now, if this damage was 6d10, which is slightly better, I would say um, 11 points more, so 33 points or thereabouts, it'll be a little bit more competitive. But I suppose, you know, you can't have everything. The blind sight, though, is really fun. Um, this is generally good. I uh, I don't like the fact that it's only 10 feet, but it is incredibly helpful, especially at higher levels when you're dealing with uh, invisible creatures, creatures concealed by all sorts of weird magic. Uh, this is kind of beneficial, so it's not the worst. And I think the damage potential here for Explosive Fury when you activate your aspect, it's a very nominal amount as well. So 3d10, you get to choose, yeah, but chances are it's still not going to be a significant amount even if you pick something that your enemies are vulnerable to. So it's certainly not the best. So how what, what do you think? Um, on my end, I would say that the Ascendant Dragon Monk, it's somewhat flavorful. Though the various energy types of the Draconic Strikes seem to lean towards Chromatic Dragons. Well, maybe a little bit to uh, Metallics as well, but certainly it doesn't seem to be very aligned to Gem Dragons at all. So I, I suppose this kind, of, this kind of feels a little off to me, but, but that's, uh, that's just something that it's a flavor thing that I don't quite, I don't quite get. But, other than that, mechanics-wise, yeah, mechanics-wise, I would say it's not the best either. It's definitely not going to be very well utilized for sure. Um, in terms of rankings for class, uh, for you know subclasses for monks, I would say that this is probably at the bottom of the tier as well. It's it's a slightly better four elements monk, I think. Um, so I would call I I would maybe call this the five elements monk. Um, so, so this is not a better five elements monk, and uh, though, though it's still not the best, but the but the core among the core uh subclasses that have been published so far, the way of the mercy monk is probably one of the better ones. Uh, open hand remains somewhere up at the top as well. Uh, while the rest, like, you know, Way of Shadow, the Way of the Long Death, and uh, the Drunken Master, come in at maybe around third place. So I would say that this is probably around the fourth place, or thereabouts, followed by, you know, uh, the Elements Monk. Yeah, so somewhat better, a bit of an improvement. You get some damage potential, but I think that the nerves that it was hit with after UA... Uh, you know, and you know how it looks like now in the final iteration in the published material, it's certainly not going to see a lot of play. There might be some synergies involved for this. Um, off the top of my head, I suppose if you were going to be playing a, um, you know, a lightning based ascendant dragon monk, you might want to take two levels of tempest cleric and work that, and work that channel divinity into this. Maybe. But other than that, I don't really foresee very much at all uh, working out for this monk. Certainly, un you know, certainly not a whole lot of uh, effectiveness on this monk. But still quite, I guess it's still something that, you know, you might want to try out if you want to try something a little different. And it might be fun if you were able to think of a better concept for that. Maybe a couple levels of this, you know, mix in some Blade Singer, configure some, you could even mess around with that, see what happens. 
Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Drake Warden Ranger as well. So the Drake Warden Ranger is a, I guess, the closest thing you would get to a dragon rider, dragon warrior kind of, kind of character in D and D right now. Because the the Drake Warden's core ability is a Drake Companion, which is really fun. You can see that in this in this piece of art here, uh, this dragonborn hugging the dragon companion. They look like they're best of friends. And the Drake Companion kind of looks like this scaly, big, happy doggo. So that's kind of cool. And I really like that. Yeah, um, the Drake Companion is a summonable pet, essentially. And of course, it uses some of the new rules that were that were more recently implemented about you know the use of pets and companions. So essentially, it gets proficiency bonus plus 14 for its natural armor, which is pretty strong. And its hit points is 5 plus 5 times your ranger level. So this scales off your ranger level. And this rewards you for playing a higher level ranger for this. Yeah, and there are some resistances and some protections as well. You got to choose the draconic acids of your Drake companion, which is pretty important here. Yeah, because this determines the immunity that it has, as well as the damage that it does with its infused strikes. So this is quite helpful. The core ability is the bite attack, which does piercing damage. And of course, it scales with your proficiency bonus, so it gets as high as plus 9, which is not the worst. Uh, it gets a maybe, I guess, a plus 9 would give it a... Um, you know, like maybe a 20% chance to hit something at with like super high AC in tier 4. But you're not really using it to attack people uh, at higher tiers. The damage is, I suppose, not fantastic. It's not the best. It's 1d6 plus your proficiency bonus. And it takes an X and you know, the creatures that it hits takes an extra 1d6 and of the relevant damage type. Yeah, according to Draconic Acids. So this is not the worst, not the best. But it is a fairly uh, sizable chunk of damage at low levels, that's for sure. Yeah, so that's something to think about. Yeah, so that's the main thing here for, the, for that. And of course, at higher levels, at higher levels, when the drake grows to a bigger size, you can ride your drake. So at level 7, uh, it cannot use its flying speed just yet. And of course, it does extra damage. So this is actually a little better. It scales up. And you gain the resistance to the damage type chosen with Draconic Acids. So this is nice. Yeah, so this is really quite helpful. And at level 11, you get the Breath Attack, which is 30-foot cone, which is not too bad at all. And the damage is pretty sizable for a, for a Ranger. Uh, for a Ranger pet, being able to deal 8d6 damage in a cone is significant. Because never has there been a ranger subclass that lets you basically throw the equivalent of a fireball, right? This is fireball damage. And there's a fair amount of damage. Even though it's a short, a short range cone, a 30 foot cone is not that great, but it is a significant amount of damage and it scales to 10 d6 at level 15. And you can use it once every long rest unless you spend a third level spell slot to recharge it, which is not too bad. So this actually does reward you, um, you know, for playing a ranger to a reasonable level and perhaps getting, a, you know, excess of third level spell slots or more from whether you're multi-classing or whatever. Right? And Perfected Bond, um, Perfected Bond is... Not too bad as well, I would say. Uh, all things considered, for a, you know, for a ranger subclass, this actually does also beef up the damage a little bit. Your drake also grows to large size, and you can use your drake as a flying mount now, which is not the worst. Uh, albeit at level fifteen, where everyone else probably has some other ability to fly, uh, you know, whether through magic or items already. So, but this is an inbuilt class ability, so. If you don't get access to magic items or you don't get a whole lot of magic items that, you know, grant the flying speed, like maybe, you know, a broom of flying or something, 
or Winged Boots, or Ring of Air Elemental Command, then this is going to be helpful. And much, you know, as much as I like to say that you know, higher tier adventures don't have places where your items may be unattuned, where there might be anti-magic or whatever, um, having this as a class ability can be very, very effective because you don't have to rely on items for the flying speed. And the resistance ability here is not bad as well. Uh, you can and you can use it for a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. And bear in mind that it says that this is when you take damage of any sort, and you can give yourself on the Drake resistance to that instance of damage. So this is pretty decent. Yeah, so you can pick and choose. So this is helpful. So just a quick recap, I guess, for the, for the Drake Warden Ranger. Uh, I was really quite happy with this when I first saw the preview during the D&D celebration event when they hid a PDF with the preview of the Drake Warden in one of the, in one of the clickable links on the website for D&D celebration 2021. And and yeah, I think I was really, really impressed by it. So this is definitely going to be one of the more fun Ranger subclasses. Uh, definitely better than the Beastmaster, uh, because everything is better than the Beastmaster after all. And I would say that this is a fairly strong contender for a flavorful yet effective Ranger subclass. So if you are not going to play a Gloom Stalker by default, because hey, we know that that's the that's a meta for uh, Adventurous League, right? Everyone and their mother's son is a Gloomstalker. So if you're not going to play a Gloomstalker, if you're not going to play a Hunter, uh, Drake Warden is probably a pretty good deal, a pretty good bat. And uh, Horizon Walker is surprisingly not very common at all. Uh, Swarm Ranger is actually pretty good too. Uh, I really love the Swarm Ranger, and I think that it's very undervalued. But that's a story for another time. Uh, and Storm Ranger being from Tasha's, but yeah, Drake Warden looks like a very, very popular choice. And I think that uh, I'll definitely be looking at building a Drake Warden myself because this is fun. I mean, who doesn't want to be a dragon rider, right? So if you want to tame your dragon and if you, if you want to have a dragon pet, this is the classical. And uh, I've never played a ranger for more than three levels in fifth edition. Um, this might be the incentive I need to take it to at least 15. Yeah, so this is something to think about. Um, now let's take a look at some of the draconic feats that are available in uh, Fizz, in Fizz Bands this time. So there's a couple of feats here that are, I guess, uh, dragon-themed, dragon-aligned. So there's Gift of the Chromatic Dragon. So this is kind of like, uh, perhaps if you were blessed by Tiamat or if you had you know your bloodline awakened and you had a trace of chromatic dragon blood in your body um, so you can use a bonus action you to imbue a weapon with some extra damage of one of the following types so acid cold fire lightning or poison we talked about this these are very common or rather more commonplace uh, damage types and you probably want to take acid. And you can't do this after you, you, uh, after you use it unless you finish a long rest. So it's actually once per long rest. Yeah, and uh, you have a reactive resistance as well. So this is kind of like absorb elements, kinda. So you can give yourself resistance to one instance of damage of the above types. And you can use this a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, which is a lot better. So this is like inbuilt uh, absorbed elements. I guess this is not. This is certainly not the worst. Yeah. Um, does this make it an auto pick for some spellcasters? Um, depends. I would say that this is probably a lot more useful on a melee class, perhaps, or a you know a class that would likely be able to not only eat the damage, but also mitigate it further by succeeding on the save. Uh, so good, probably good on a Paladin, because you got decent saves all around anyway as a Paladin. 
And this is something that doesn't take a spell slot. So think of it as absorb elements without spell slots. I'm not too sure about the damage type. The damage bonus, I guess it's good for a low level, you know, at super low levels, a tier one, maybe this is okay. You may want to take this on a variant human in tier one. Or if you were using a custom lineage, a tier one with a feat, um, might be okay. You might want to retrain, respec out of it, you know, as, as you get to higher tiers. Certainly not the worst kind of feat. It would be a lot better if there was a um, an ability score bonus, like maybe if it gave you like a point of ability score, like maybe in one of the physical stats. I would have been okay with that. But yeah, I don't think it's really that great. Don't think I don't think it's really worth the trade-off. Um, Gift of the Gem Dragon. So increases one of your caster stats, basically your mental ability scores by one. Uh, and the Telekinetic Reprisal. It's essentially a um, kind of like hellish rebuke plus a push. So not the worst. Um, it's a good, I, I suppose it's a good getaway or a good, um, a good ability to basically shove someone who's come up in your face if you are a caster far away from you, giving you the opportunity to maybe um, back off and cast more spells. So not terrible the only problem here i would say is that it's a strength saving throw which most creatures that get up close and personal with you in your face would be likely to pass yeah so certainly not the best now if this were a dexterity save it would be a little different it would be a lot better But yeah, so again, this is flavorful, I suppose. It's like a telekinetic thrust or, a, or maybe a blast of psychic energy uh, or, a, or, you know, you consolidating your mental force into a battering ram and sending it flying at someone who's come up to you and tried to strike you with a weapon. So yeah, so it kind of knocked it back. But I wouldn't say that this is the best. Uh, Gift of the Metallic Dragon. Uh, this gives you the Cure Wounds spell, which you can use once. And you can also use your spell slots to cast this. So this is actually pretty decent. So this gives anyone who has spell slots uh, basically the Cure Wounds spell on their spell list in that sense. And you get a free cast of it as well. So if you want to be a little, you know, want to be a sorcerer who's like draconic, uh, who uses the draconic uh, bloodline, and you still want to be able to heal yourself or your friends, you can just take Gift of the Metallic Dragon. It kind of works. Uh, I suppose this also kind of ties in with the whole, you know, the whole legend about how dragon blood and dragon saliva and dragon tears and all that stuff can uh, can mend wounds and and you know heal ailments and stuff like that so this is kind of kind of flavorful i suppose and protective wings i guess isn't terrible either because it's a bonus to ac equal to proficiency bonus so this can go up to six at higher levels so this is actually quite strong. This is like a like a shield spell, but not a shield spell in that sense. It's not so strong at lower levels, but at higher levels, this is pretty solid. Uh, it's a reaction as well. And this is a decent reaction filler, especially, again, if you are a melee class. Um, this is insane on the Paladin, potentially, especially if you have great armor to begin with. So... So I would say Gift of the Metallic Dragon is probably one of the better ones here. So Gift of the Gem Dragon, not so much. Um, chromatic and Metallic is kind of where it's at when it comes to feats. Yeah, so that's, um, that's the class options, class features so far. And... 
for the next part, I think I'm going to just take a quick look at some of the spells as well. Uh, let's take a quick look at the spells that are going to be in play. And I would say quite a lot of these spells have started making their appearance on the character sheets of uh, Adventures League players. And with very good reason. These spells are really pretty cool. And generally, these spells are quite flavorful and helpful um, for the discerning wizard or anyone who might be a sorcerer or whatever. So th these are generally great spells to have. So let's take a look at them in alphabetical order. Um, Ashardalon's Stride. So Ashardalon is this red dragon, a uh, really cool, really imposing looking red dragon. And essentially, this is like uh, a lot of these, fi these fiery spells that give you, uh, you know, a trail of fire that leaves a trail of fire behind you when you, when you move around. So I remember there being a spell like this in uh, in Diablo when I used to play uh, Diablo, and I remember that there are quite a few other spell, uh, quite a few other, you know, games that have something similar as well. More recently in New World, uh, if you were using the Fire Staff, one of the spells on the Fire Staff uh, does something similar as well. You basically move quite quickly, and you leave a trail of fire behind you. So. This is kind. This is kind of what it is. It's a bonus action spell, so it gives you a speed increase of twenty feet, and you don't provoke any OAs when you move, which is really nice. Uh, so this is kind of like a bit of a mix between expeditious retreat and some extra damage as well. So I don't really like the fact that this is a move as opposed to a teleport effect, but. This is certainly not the worst, and there are some, certainly some perks to moving rather than teleporting. And let's not forget that um, this also means that you can, if you have a fly speed and you are moving you know, while flying, uh, it doesn't provoke OAs, so it's, it's pretty okay. Yeah, uh, 1d6 fire damage isn't the best. It's a very nominal amount of damage. For a third level spell, uh, you're really looking at the speed increase and the not provoking OAs as the primary of primary effect. Um, the damage isn't the best, but it does scale fairly well. So if you look at the scaling, you can see here that it increases your speed by five feet for each spell slot above third, and the damage also increases for each spell slot above third. So this is actually a decent, healthy amount of damage. Uh, if you cast the higher slot, and if you want, to f if you ever figure out a way to run um, circles around your fr around your enemies, I, I suppose you could deal some healthy damage to them, and at the same time set the terrain on fire if it's flammable terrain, uh, because it says an object that isn't being worn or carried takes damage as well. So, so yeah. Um, Flavorful, somewhat thematic, um, the damage isn't the best, the scaling is not the best, the speed improvement is not the worst. So, generally not a, not a terrible spell. The fact that it lasts for a minute is not terrible either, because this means that you can, you can as long as you're concentrating on it, you can do quite a bit with the extra movement speed. Draconic Transformation, I don't really know how to feel about this. I like the blind sight. And I kind of like the fact that the breath weapon here is force damage. And the wings do give you a reasonably good flying speed, but this is a level 7 spell. And if you notice, this is also a bonus action spell, which is quite an interesting choice. So rather than taking an action to cast this, this is a bonus action spell, which means that you could probably utilize this and do something else with your action, like maybe uh, manipulate a magic item, or um, you know you could cast a cantrip on top of that. So if you were maybe using this to fly up and then you know drop a Durin's instant fortress on someone. Um, 
that's pretty okay. And the breath weapon here, I guess a good thing about it is it's a bonus action on subsequent turns for the duration. And it's a cone, so it's a fairly large amount of damage in a large area. So I guess that that's not the worst because it becomes a bonus action filler. And I suppose this is a this is a good uh, alternative to the very typical 7th level spell pick, which is Crown of Stars. So this is possible. But Crown of Stars uh, or Draconic Transformation, you're going to have to, I guess you're going to have to try to uh, decide which one is more valuable to you. And remember that Draconic Transformation has a concentration requirement as well. So this might be one of those things that makes or breaks uh, Draconic Transformation. But all in all, the package is pretty good. You get your you get your uh, sight abilities, you get your detection abilities, you get your breath weapon for some for some bonus action to fill or damage, and you get your movement skill abilities. Uh, you get your movement in in the case of the wings. So this is generally not a bad use of a seventh level spell slot. Uh, yeah, so not too bad. <laughs> Bispin's uh, Platinum Shield, also a bonus action spell, if you notice. There are quite a few bonus action spells here, as you've seen so far. Uh, also Concentration, and this basically creates a barrier, essentially, around someone, giving half cover. So half cover, uh, as you can see, gives a bonus of plus two to armor and dexterity saves. So this is a good bonus to saves and armor in general. And um, where it comes to damage resistance, you get resistance to multiple damage types. So this is pretty good. All in all, a pretty strong selection uh, in terms of spells uh, for this one, I will say. This is a pretty all right protection spell. Yeah, and you get the ability to evade damage. So it gives you evasion. So it's not too bad. And you can use a bonus action to to shift the, the barrier to someone else. So this is not the worst uh, in terms of protecting your allies. And this is actually quite strong. Uh, if you think about it, if you have uh, if you're standing at the back of the in the back line of your party and you were and you were basically, you know, uh, buffing your allies. This is a good buff. It's a great buff if you had a if you had someone up front, you know, either tanking or dealing damage, and uh, they were they were taking the brunt of the hits. So th this barrier uh, from Fizzbend's Platinum Shield would give them a lot more survivability. So not a bad pick. Um, I would say, though for 6th level, uh, considering the fact that you have limited 6th level slots, I would say this is something you may want to use sparingly, but generally not a bad spell at all. Uh, Nathar's Mischief. So, it's a mischievous surge. Uh, some minor control ability. I like the fact that it's a piece of crust from an apple pie for the component. So it's a it's a nice bit of flavor. You would you would think that this is the kind of spell that might befit a pseudo dragon, for example. You know, especially since you know pseudo dragons do kind of like snacking on stuff, so apple pie kind of makes sense. And you roll at the start of each of your turns for the effect, right? So you get either Charm, uh, Blind, in cap, or uh, Difficult Terrain in the area. So this is generally a whole bundle of reasonably good effects. And you can move the cube around as well. So this is not too bad. So this is a field that can be shifted around. This is one action to cast as opposed to a bonus action. Uh, requires a concentration, but this is generally strong as a control kind of spell if you are playing a more debuff kind of spellcaster. Uh, yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if someone picks this. Uh, Charmed is not the greatest, and especially if you were 
uh, gonna do do this in combat, but it does make you less of a target. Um, blinded is generally good for combat for sure. Uh, incapacitated is insanely good for combat, and difficult terrain can generally make things difficult for your enemies to get closer, and it might be a good way for you to uh, to manipulate the battlefield. So. For four effects, even though it's kind of random, at least two of the effects are generally strong. Uh, the others are conditionally strong, I suppose. So not the worst. But bear in mind that some creatures cannot be charmed, cannot be blinded, and so on and so forth. Right? So something to think about. And this is a spell that you don't upcast. There's no option to upcast. There's no extra damage. There's no... or, or whatever. But this is still generally helpful. Uh, Rowlothim's Psychic Lance, I would say, is a strong contender for a great 4th level spell. It's an action to cast, it has a good range of 120 feet, that's about 24 squares, uh, it's pretty much halfway across most battlefields, uh, and definitely hits things within range in a dungeon environment where there's a small enclosed area, so this is good. It's a psychic damage uh, attack, and it has a incapacitated rider, so even better, it's an intelligence saving throw, which is a difficult and rare save. Most optimized adventurers will not be able to make this save, because they dump their intelligence. Most monsters that you face in the wild will not be able to make this save because they are just not very intelligent. Though some of them, like the average goblin, tend to be somewhat more intelligent than players. So we'll see. Um, nonetheless, psychic damage plus incapacitated is pretty strong. And this makes a fairly big difference in a lot of adventures, I would say. This is going to be the go-to spell. For a lot of players. So if you were a DM like me uh, and you came across players who want to spam Rolothim's Psychic Lance, uh, one of the things that you that you can probably do is to is to remember that this is psychic damage, which means mind blank will save the lives of your NPCs. Yeah, so that's one of the things to think about. Um, there are a nominal number of creatures that are immune or resistant to psychic damage as well. So that's something to think about. But the main thing that is really, really fun about this is not so much the damage or the in-cap, but this particular line over here. If you take a look at this, this is a great way for you to target someone within earshot, within range, who is trying to become invisible or to hide, or is well disguised. And this can come in surprisingly uh, in a number of mystery adventures or in, uh, in campaigns that you might need to deal with subterfuge of people who are just not who they seem to be. If you can pick out a name, and I would say typically this will be the per the character's name that they are known by, whatever name they have listed in their NPC entry. And then they take the damage and they get stunned, or rather incapacitated. And, and that is amazing. So if you're walking around in a crowd, and you know that the murderer is somewhere in the crowd, and you know the person's name, if it's Bob, the murderer, right? Um, you could just yell Bob the murderer as you're casting the spell. And no matter how well disguised Bob is, he's going to get hit. And he's going to take the 76 psychic damage and he's going to be incapacitated until the start of your next turn if he fails to save. And that is amazing. It's going to blast so many holes in so many mystery stories. I'm not even kidding. It's super good. And maybe, you know, that's kind of why you get this as a 4th level spell. You get this at tier 2, where um, you already also have other tools to, you know, to use when you are playing a mystery adventure. So, so I guess everything kind of works out.
but yeah, this is a really fun spell. I really like this, and you know, just for the hell of it, I am probably gonna be using this spell a fair bit as well on my on my wizards. It's just that good. Rhymes binding eyes, and as you can see, this is a great picture here, showing how rhymes binding eyes might kind of work. It's kind of like a very it's a very typical uh eyes based magic that you might see in MMORPGs or in uh you know other games and whatever, right? So it's kind of like Frost Nova we, or like um Encase or whatever. You get you get people stuck in ice, they take some cold damage at the same time. And the main thing about it is that while they are stuck in the ice formation, it lasts for a minute or until someone uses their action to break the ice. So this is super good. The damage isn't a whole lot, it's about 3d8, so this is not the highest, but it does have an ability for you to upcast, so if you cast it at a higher level slot, you deal more damage, so that's not the worst. But the main thing here is that a creature hindered by ice has its speed reduced completely to zero. So this is really strong. And it can break encounters. As a DM, you want to keep an eye out for this. As a player, you definitely want to pick this because this is probably going to be your best second level spell that you will ever have. And at a close range, kind of like a control spell, it's got all the right buttons, uh, or rather it hits all the right notes. So this is, this is great. So Rhymes Binding Eyes is definitely something you want as a spellcaster even though the range is not the best, right? Even though it's only a 30-foot cone, it is still one of the better spells at second level. In fact, I'm hard-pressed to think of a spell at second level that is quite as strong as Rhyme's Binding Eyes right now. And if you can think of one, you know, comment, let me know. And I'm definitely excited. Well, yeah, Misty Step for sure, I would say. And in fact, Misty Step is probably one of the ways that you can use to get out of the hindering eyes. So it's not that bad. Though I would assume that the eyes does cling to you, uh, since since the only clause for getting out of it would be for someone to, you know, to use an action to break it away. Or if you use your action to break away from the eyes. So yeah. Nonetheless, a generally good spell here. Um, lots and lots of uses. Definitely great at lower tiers. At tier 1, this is going to break so many encounters. I love it. And yeah, super good spell. Summon Draconic Spirit. Uh, so I, I'm generally not a big fan of the Summon X type of creature spells. I've always found them to be a bit of a waste of a spell slot. But I suppose this is not the worst when it comes to providing um, you know, an extra kind of an extra filler. So this is probably one of the few uh, summon spells that that you might be able to use as a um, as a caster to get an extra you know filler action on your turn. So the dragon breath attack is not that great. Yeah, and the damage potential is also not that great. Even though it kind of scales off the spell's level, um, the rend is only of a very nominal damage. So even if you were using a ninth level spell slot, for example, you'll be dealing 1d6 plus 13 piercing damage with every rend. And you'll be dealing a nominal amount of damage with every breath attack, so... Certainly not the best, I would say.
So yeah, um, like I said, I'm not too fond of the summon spells. Um, I guess you could get some utility, get some flavor uh, out of this. This might be a bit flavorful. And of course, uh, it does obey your verbal command, so you're gonna need to be able to talk to, to you know to command it. So yeah, something to think about. It's certainly not that great. Um, and I probably wouldn't pick this myself, but I guess if you were hard pressed to have extra action economy on your end, this is probably okay. So yeah, so so that's that for uh, looking at the character options. I'm not gonna go, or I might just give a quick glance at the magic items available. I would say, um, uh, in particular, I'll be looking at a dragon hide belt, which is this. Um, the dragon lance is very flavorful. I'll talk about it in a little while as well. Uh, chances are you will probably never be able to pick this up in Adventures League because these are not seeded so far. These have never been seeded. Though I think that the community is really hoping for the Dragon Hide Belt to be added to the pool of items that you get when you get beyond level five. So um when you want when since you know quite a few of the other items on that list like the dragon blood uh, was it the blood well vial or the um or some of the other items like the uh, multi-tool and stuff like that. These are things that increase the DC as well as benefit a particular class. And the dragon hide belt is the monk's item. It's the monk's, it's answer for monks, essentially, because it buffs up your saving throw DC for your key features. And it also gives you the option to regain key points equal to one roll of your martial arts die. So. This is actually very beneficial to monks. And I wouldn't be surprised if this eventually makes it onto the list. Maybe a dragon height belt plus one. But fingers crossed, I don't know if that's ever going to happen in Adventures League. Uh, but this is definitely on the wish list of a lot of players. And I know this because there's a lot of conversation around this and people are excited about that. So, so we'll see what happens. Maybe we'll get lucky, maybe we won't. But Dragon Hide Belt is one of the ways that you could kind of beef up a monk a little bit so that their, their DC is not, um, you know, capped at around 18-ish or thereabouts. So they can, they can stun a little bit better. Um, other items you will find here, like the Dragon Lance, this is the canonical Dragon Lance, I guess, you know, from, from the Dragon Lance novels. By Margaret Ways and Tracy Hickman, uh, and incidentally, Dragonlance was the series that I that first got me into D and D. And well, these are kind of fantastic, because look at that. It's a plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls, and when you hit a dragon with this weapon, you deal extra damage. And any dragon of your choice that you can see within thirty feet of you can use this reaction to make a melee attack. So if you were a mounted dragon rider. So maybe you are a, um, you know, a Drake Warden Ranger, perhaps, and you and you were riding on your mount at high le high enough levels, and you had Dragon Lance, you could stab someone, you could stab an enemy with this, and then have your pet attack as well, I guess. So this is kind of fun. It's very flavorful, very in keeping because this is totally what happened, uh, in the Dragon Lance stories where they had dragon riding knights and all. Um, yeah, great flavor. I love this. Uh, probably never gonna appear in AL unless there is a Dragon Lance, you know, Crin uh, related campaign. So we'll see. Uh, fingers crossed. Dragon Wing Bow here as well is really cool. So this one lets you deal extra damage uh, of a certain elemental type, basically equivalent to whatever breath weapon is infused in the bow. And of course, we know we want force damage because that's the best. It's the most difficult to resist. And the beauty of this bow is that it makes its own ammunition. I really want to see this appear in an Adventurous League uh, module, but I think that's going to be tough as well. Like, you'll, you'll never know what's going to be seeded. And if this ever comes out in a module, 
uh, that module is going to sell so well, it's going to be so sought after. Because it's really hard to find a solid magic bow that does good damage and gives you options like this one. Yeah, and the fact that you don't need to make ammunition really makes a big difference. Um, yeah, so flail, gold canary, platinum scarf. So a couple items here that are kind of flavorful and cool, but probably not going to be very AL legal if at all. And then we have the Topaz Annihilator. I'm just going to talk a little bit about this because this is basically your disintegration gun, right? So you have a dragon powered disintegration laser beam gun kind of thing. Uh, it does necrotic damage. So you go zap, zap, someone, someone's, uh, someone's arm falls off. And if you reduce them to zero hit points, uh, they get disintegrated, which is awesome. And you can use an action to cast a disintegrate spell with a DC of 18. Um, so you can fire a death ray from the gun, essentially. And it is super, it, this is super powerful. And also super fun, and also a legendary, and also probably not ever going to appear in AL. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. And... That was that was our uh, very very quick preview of some of the things in Twist Bands for players. So let me just pop back here for a little bit. Just do that. And... Yeah. So what do you think so far of uh, Twist Bands and what you have seen? I I think that. There definitely is a lot of potential here uh, in Fizz Bands for, for adventurous thing for sure. If you were ever going to build a character, um, I would say if I were ever to make uh, a Drake Warden, uh, I might go with 15 levels of Drake Warden Ranger, a uh, couple levels in Fighter for an Action Surge, and maybe a couple levels in Cleric just because. So it's a it's a decent kind of it's a decent kind of combination that I think will probably be working with if I ever build up to level twenty. Um, Ascendant monk. Not quite sure how I would do it yet, but I think that you're gonna definitely need to go at least your seventeen levels ascendant monk to make it somewhat competitive compared to other classes. So that's gonna be one of the challenges I think for ascendant monk. Because all the other classes are gonna be really strong by the time you get you you even come into your own as a as an ascendant monk. So so that's one of the challenges that you will face, mm -hmm. and not to mention the fact that your damage potential is always behind the curve. So there might be some opportunity, I I suppose, in um, building towards a. Maybe a monk paladin hybrid. Uh, I'm still thinking a little bit about that. Some it's a, it's just an idea I'm toying with. But that might be interesting to see. That might be something to explore and uh, and work with for the dragon ascendant monk. But I'm not quite sure just yet. So so yeah. Just gonna grab a bit of grab a bit of water. Hey there! Thanks for joining us tonight. We were just talking about the options in Fizban and uh, how we were how we might build a Drake Warden Ranger or an or a um, an Ascendant Dragon Monk. Yeah, it's unfortunate that the monks are gonna be a little. Uh, less strong than other classes. Multi-classic may make it a little better, I suppose, but you, you're probably still, you know, uh, gonna be behind because uh, your damage potential is poor. And even if you, you're gonna action surge and you're gonna be blasting people with, uh, you know, with your, with your, you know, area effect attack, you know, as a monk, 
it's still just at most four times of your martial arts die at level 17, which is not the best. I, I suppose you could be there to clear away the mooks, you know, like uh, maybe the, the those rank and fall goblins, the CR1 creatures, um, that are just milling about helplessly as you're as you're just beating your way through to the to the end boss. But it's it's not certainly not the best. The spells though are kind of great. I think we already looked at the spells and we can probably agree that the spells are all super strong. Uh, so far, looking at all the spells, especially the um, Rhymes Binding Eyes, now that is really good for, for a level 2 spell ability. Um, level 2 spell in general, it's got good damage, it's got good control. It locks people down completely if they are all caught in a cone. Rolithin's Psychic Lance is really good as well. Uh, it's things that you otherwise cannot see. So if you encounter someone who has greater invisibility as well, um, you're just probably going to zap them with all of them psychic lands even then, and then you'll see them, you know, maybe taking some damage, getting incapacitated, losing concentration on whatever spell it is that's concealing them. And now that will be brilliant. Uh, so that's something to think about. If you are going to be using, you know, all of them psychic lands and you are a player, it's a really good way to get rid of invisible people or people who are, you know, hiding behind certain spell attacks that might obscure them from your line of sight or your vision or whatever, as long as you can name them. So th that's quite good. So think about how you might want to use that creatively. Um, so Fizzband's shield was, uh, was, was pretty good as well. I think we saw that as well, so that's really nice. And uh, Draconic Transformation, some uses there. Uh, I need to really use it myself in a game to determine how well I like it, how effective it is for me. So yeah, so it's a general, just general, you know, look over of this fence right now. And I think that we're going to be seeing a lot more of these, uh, these classes and these spells appear in Adventures League. So as a DM, you probably want to familiarize yourself with those as well. Uh, maybe go, maybe go grab your own copy of Fizzbands. Uh, if you are interested in pre-ordering Fizzbands, we actually, uh, we're actually looking to, to work something out for that as well on our end. Uh, so so do come check out our Geekified store, um, as and when we do close our pre-orders for Fizzbands, uh, in the coming weeks. So, so that's one of the things that you can try uh, if you want to get your own copy of this fence. And of course, if you are a member, uh, if you have been, if you have joined us as a, as a member, uh, you might be able to get access to access to our, our books on, um, you know, on demand as well. So, so that might be a good, good way for you to get your hands on some of this band's content too. Yeah, so, so how are you liking Fizzbands so far? And for those of you who have just joined us, hello, welcome. Good to have you with us. So, absolutely love Fizzbands. What do you think you're you're gonna be playing from this band in future? Is there something is there something that you already have in mind? Already have a Drake Warden. Uh Dragon Stat Blocks. Yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about Dragon Stat Blocks really, really soon. Uh I think that we have some game masters, some DMs here as well with us tonight and I think we're all going to be pretty excited to just plow through uh, the, the dragon stat blocks because everyone loves their dragons, right? I know I love my dragons. So let's take a quick look at the dragons that we have available in Fizzbats. So let's, without further ado, 
So you can see that there are obviously some uh, role play and lore and world building stuff here. So that's stuff that will be of interest to you if you want to tell your own stories. Um, so, so Ryan ignored everyone for two hours after reading uh, Dragonomicon. I, I guess it makes sense. Uh, it's such a, after reading Fizzband's Treasury, um, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. So there's, so there's this thing here called the Dragonomicon, which basically is an interesting section that they added. Uh, it's some lore-oriented content. So they actually cover some of the uh, some of the tools that are beneficial to you as a game master as a DM. So you can actually roll for some of the trades. There are some tables here um, that might be helpful to helping you tell stories involving certain dragons, certain specific types. Yeah, and there are some uh, some 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 opportunities here for you to build encounters as well. Uh, that are based off a d8 role. So not the worst. Uh, I, I think that this action is useful for players and yeah, uh, rather for DMs, not so much for players. A lot of this is stuff behind the hood, behind the DM screen. So there's, there's some maps included here. So this is nice. Uh, even a player version. So you can take a look at that. So, so this is pretty helpful for if you want to tell your own stories, a little bit of dragon encounter, dragon adventure kind of thing. So this chapter of the Dragonomicon in the Fizzbands book is pretty good. Uh, there's things like, you know, spell casting, extra spells and stuff like that. So this is fun, uh, good for world building and stuff in general of that sort, yeah, for, for your own adventures. But because we are doing Adventures League, we are chatting about Adventures League content, uh, we're going to skip the Dragonomicon section. Uh, dragons in play, not so much. You may want to read the dragon characters portion if you are a player. Uh, it might give you some ideas. Um, Lairs and Hordes, not so much. Dragonomicon, definitely not so much. But the bestiary is going to be fun if you are a game master, if you are a DM. So let's take a look at the bestiary section here. So let's jump over. And you can see this is a very lovely picture. I love this. So you, you can see the dragons uh, battling against each other. Look at that. Look at that dragon up in the clouds there, that blue dragon. This is, um, this is amazing. Right? So it, I guess this is maybe a Drake Warden on their, on their you know, their Drake Companion, uh, perhaps. And there's a, there's a sorcerer here, or a storm sorcerer maybe, I don't know. Um, and this is obviously um, the Grand Master of Flowers. This is, this, is, this is Bahamut in his human guise uh, because of the canaries. Yeah, and, and his scarf and all. And if you played uh, you know, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, uh, you, you would recognize this outfit and the hair and the, and the birds. Uh, if you if you pull the planeswalker card, so yeah, this is pretty fun. Nice artwork, yeah. So, uh, let's take a look at some of the bestiary entries here. So we have amethyst dragon. Uh, this is obviously a pretty cool dragon. Look at the lair actions. Now I love this. Look at this imprisoning force, force cage, super fun. You will never, ever see a lair action as cool as this. So this is a obviously one of the more powerful gem dragons, uh, the amethyst. The amethysts are seen to be like I guess you know at the head of the pack when it comes to gem dragons, and they have such cool abilities. Um, the the imprisoning force is obviously the most awesome one, uh, right here. And you probably use this to trap, you know, silly marshals that don't have movement skills and teleporting effects uh, behind the force cage, and then you laugh at them as you massacre their friends. But what DM would do that? Certainly not me. I say as I think about this. <laughs> but yeah, so so amethyst dragons are super awesome. Uh, look at that. Look at the stat block. Um, 
They have some really cool spells and abilities. Uh, their breath attack creates a gravitational force. And first of all, there's a DC 23 strength save. Uh, you, you fail the save, you take some damage, and your speed becomes zero. It's like, uh, it's like making a black hole, a singularity, essentially, in the area, and then uh, bad stuff happens to people. And of course, they have spell casting as well, so this is super good. Globe of Invulnerability is great against most would-be Dragon Slayers. Freedom of Movement is great as well, because uh, it doesn't require concentration. Uh, if it casts Freedom of Movement on itself, and then it covers itself with a Globe of Invulnerability, it can do a lot of horrible things uh, to players, even if they think that they are prepared. And look at this Psychic Stab ability, oh my goodness. Look at that. How cool is that? It has inbuilt teleportation. Super awesome. Psychic Stab is kind of like Misty Stab, but Psychic. So it just, so using ma amazing mental powers slides through space. So this is, um, this is awesome. And look at that. Look at that. Legendary actions. Psychic Stab as a legendary action. Spell casting as a legendary action. And it has this ability to make the uh, crystal. Uh, it spits out a crystal that explodes and knocks people prone. So this is pretty decent as well. So yeah, so Amethyst Dragons are super fun from the looks of it. Even an adult Amethyst Dragon is a pretty good challenge. Uh, CR 16, I, I would say, yeah, this is probably okay for a mid-tier 3 adventure. Uh, so it kind of works. Even a young Amethyst Dragon is pretty cool. Yeah, it's not the most powerful, but it does remain a fairly credible threat. Especially since it has 168 hit points as well, decent armor. Um, the Singularity Breath still does a fair bit of damage, and it's a good debuff, so it's really fun. I uh, really like this. And look at the art. Wow. Look at the mane of uh, Crystal Shards. Super cool. Okay, animated breath. Uh, so this is a this is a pretty cool elemental creature. Very thematically appropriate in certain cases. You would probably be able to use this uh, as a thematically appropriate monster in certain adventures as well. It's only CR six, so it's not the most. Uh, I guess it's not the most powerful but it has some interesting abilities. So you can see that there are different uh, abilities associated with it. And if you were to ever run something that involves a dragon, uh, you might want to use an animated breath as a thematically appropriate add-on. Like maybe if you were running an adventure like in a... Uh, with Horde of the Dragon Queen, perhaps, and if you had come to uh, to battle some dragons in the process, maybe an animated breath is a thematically appropriate add-on to the encounter. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it's, it's really quite fun. Aspect of Bahamut, uh, well, this is kind of like if you wanted to fight... Uh, the Platinum Dragon God, I suppose. Aspect of Tiamat. You might be familiar kind of with uh, dealing with Tiamat if you were if you ever played Rise of Tiamat, I, I guess. And look at that. Look at Tiamat in all her infernal majesty. So cool. So chromatic great worm. Uh, so these are the super powerful, super ancient worms uh, that are CR27. So if you were to battle one of the really ancient, uh, iconic dragons in the stories in 
Forgotten Realms. Uh, these are super. These are great. Look at Mythic actions. Mythic actions are insane. So they deal a lot. They, they deal extra damage, or they deal. They have some extra abilities, and, and these are great. So if you if you were to think of like you know named dragons like cloth perhaps or um if you had played one of the re one of the more recent epics if you had if you had encountered shagralar shagralar would probably be a chromatic great work but of course you know i'm not going to talk too much about that and you know drop too many spoilers or stab uh, about the stab blocks but yeah this is really cool I i'm really excited about about possibly using a chromatic great worm uh maybe in a home game because i don't think that this would be very very suitable for a um for an adventurous league game not just yet maybe there'll be an there will be an option to try uh, a chromatic great worm uh at some point in time we'll see but it's really kind of cool uh look at that oh wow i mean i love the art i hope you love the art as well because that is insanely awesome. And awesome is the only word I can think about uh, to describe this ginormous dragon, you know, setting fire to that poor town over yonder. This is like, this is a catastrophe waiting to happen. Look at that. The crystal dragons are well basically these as you can see kind of cutish again you look at the main of you know uh crystalline shards and the tail the tail is kind of cute because it's like multiple wispy strands uh as, as part of the tail and they have all sorts of fun and interesting abilities as well so psychic step again so Awesome things like psychic stat. Scintillating breath is radiant damage. This is radiant damage, people. A breath attack that does radiant damage is so amazing, and it re and it gains twenty five temporary hit points when it deals damage with the dragon breath. So it's always got this ten twenty five temporary hit points as a shield every time it u uses its breath weapon. Um, it's got cool a cool ability called Starlight Strike. So this is kind of cute. It's radiant damage again. Uh, it has a really cool name. So it's kind of like Starlight Strike is like Starlight Breaker, but not. So, so this is kind of fun. I, I really like this uh, Crystal Dragon as well. Crystal Dragon Wormling is so adorable. Look at that. My goodness. It is super cute. It's got this slightly derpy expression on its face, but you probably don't want to cross that, especially if it's hungry. So let's take a look at what else is in the bestiary. Deep dragons. I really love the deep dragons in the past. Um, I, I guess they, they kind of got uglier, I suppose. They kind of got a whole lot uglier uh, right now in Fizzband's treasury. And they kind of look like a cross between a dragon and some sort of weird ass abomination. Uh, look at that. It looks kind of derpy as well. But yeah, deep dragons. So nightmare breath. Uh, nightmare breath is psychic damage. So this is this is pretty cool, and it frightens the targets. Yeah, it kind of, it's kind of like that. Yeah, it, it's it's like this underground kind of kind of dragon kind of thing. Yes, it has spores, and these spores cause people to attack uh, their friends. So, and they can fire poisonous spores at people as well. So, 
generally cool concept. And I guess this is this is the sketch for the Deep Dragon. Um, yeah, it, it kind of looks disturbing. It looks more disturbing than it was in the past. Yeah, so they are they are under dark bound dragons. And you can read more about the flavor, more about the lore. It's quite cool. Draco Hydra. Look at that. Wow. It's a not Tiamat. It's Chibi Tiamat, I guess. So five heads, uh, special abilities, lots of abilities, lots of extra reactions for OAs for every head that it has. And it has a prismatic breath attack, so it's not too bad. CR11, uh, this is a good addition if you were playing some adventures and you were looking for something cool to add in as a CR11 encounter uh, as a thematically appropriate addition. If you want a bit of a challenge, a Draco Hydra probably isn't too bad. So if you were to use this in your adventures, definitely let me know how it turned out. I'm quite excited to see uh, how this looks like. So Draconians, these are creatures from Kryn. Uh, they, were, they were featured in the Dragonlance, Dragonlance series. Uh, so they had different colors and different abilities. Some of them could turn to stone, some of them could explode. I'm not going to go too much into this because uh, if whenever you get your hands on, you know, uh, fizz bands yourself, you can look at it. They are, they're mostly low-level creatures. Uh, draconic shards are quite interesting in that sense. They are undead. They are essentially... Uh, crystal shards that are that you know host draconic spirits so there's this spectral dragon image and their psychic powers well up into the uh into the crystals and they become these things yeah and it's really quite cool so this is something to to explore as well they're they are nowhere near as powerful as their original uh not so much uh, as powerful as you know as it was if it were a dragon but they are decently uh, CR 17 so you could use this in a tier 3 encounter if you wanted uh, if it were thematically appropriate to do so unfortunately a lot of these uh, things in fist bands will probably never make it into the upcoming crop of uh, wild beyond the Witchlight uh, dungeon craft adventures because they were not listed as an allowable source for DMs and creators uh, when they're doing their own content. But if you were to be running an adventure at your own table, if you were planning to add a thematically appropriate monster, Fizzbands may be a viable source. So it's something to think about. Okay, let's keep scrolling and looking at stuff oh my goodness a dragon blood ooze look at that oozy oozy thing here so so yeah large ooze um cr5 yeah so maybe if you wanted a cr5 creature to replace something and you were running maybe ooze there or uh or fenaris gambit you could think about using dragon blood ooze as an alternative for one of as a replacement, maybe. Not that I'll ever do it. Well, maybe I'll do it. Yeah. I think I might do it in one of the upcoming runs. We'll see. Let's see what happens. But yeah, Dragon Blood Ooze. Kind of cool. Look at that. Super fun. Uh, Dragon Bone Golem. Uh, petrifying Breath. Decent. Poison Damage, though. Not the best. Uh, Dragonborn Champions. These are basically humanoids. So these, these are kind of like NPCs you, that you can use as well, I suppose. And yeah, so to think about that. So they have some very thematically appropriate uh, ability score, uh, abilities, and their ability scores are not the worst. Um, generally strong, their resistances as well. 
it's really a shame, I think, that we can't use Fizzbands because there's so much potential here. Uh, if we were to use some draconic related things in, you know, our uh, Vault Beyond the Witch Light Dungeon Craft. Dragon Flash Grafter, these are these are quite kind of interesting as well, as you can see. Uh, so these are pe these are people that have uh, grafted portions of dragon uh, parts themselves. So you get abominations. Oh no! This brings me back to Full Metal Alchemist. Look at that! My goodness! Look at the hair draping on this dragon. Oh dear! Is it it's taking a bit of time to load. But look at that. Look even look at the pose. You just can you imagine this thing going at word? Yeah, it's not fated to be previewed, I guess. Uh yeah, it is a cursed image. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> So yeah, so these are these are just like more NPC stat blocks essentially. Um, yeah, NPC stat blocks. Uh, Dragon L. Not too bad. It's, it's it's kind of a decent mount. It's an arrow mount. You might end up seeing this in some of those stories where um, it's a CR two. So it could be a dragon mount for for you know some elite troop of a of a kingdom or something. If you are doing your own homebrew, I wouldn't be surprised. If you build a, if you build a entire unit of Dragonel knights, right? So that kind of makes sense. Um, a paladin can use find greater steed to summon a Dragonel. Look here, as it says here. So this might be a possible option if you were using find greater steed from Xanathar's. So not not the worst uh, option either because it has a flying speed. Yeah, it's kind of cool. So great for paladins, uh, as it says here. Uh, Dragon turtles, we have seen this before. This is also, I think, uh, an artwork from MTG as well. I might have seen this on one of the cards in uh, Adventures in Forgotten Realms. I, but I've seen so many cards in Adventures in, from, you know, from Forgotten Realms that I can't remember all of it. <laughs> But yeah, ancient dragon turtle as opposed to regular dragon turtle. So extra dragon turtle types. Yeah, and now we're going to just jump to the next chapter and look at some of the other monsters. Um, egg hunter. It's a parasite that eats dragon eggs. Uh, so it's kind of this bug, I guess. Uh, elder brain dragon. Now we were talking about this just now. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, brain sucking dragon. This is disgustingly good. Look at that. Okay, it's taking a while to load. There we go. Oh my goodness. This is super cool. So, if you were a fan of Illithid, Mind Flayers, um, Sotong, I guess, this is amazing. Man, look at that. It's an aberration, of course. What else would it be? It's a siege monster as well, so yeah, unusual nature. Uh, Multi-attacks, tentacles. The breath weapon is insane. Con save, uh, psychic damage, and you get infested with an illithid tadpole. So this is crazy good. It's a debuff, so basically at the start of each of the turns, uh, it takes some psychic damage. And if you if you die, basically uh, bad stuff happens. Look at that. You become a mind flayer. If bad if you die uh, and get reduced to zero hit points by the infestation of tadpoles. So this is one way, I guess, you could permanently retire your AL character. You become a Sotong too, right? So this is this is kind of cool. I kind of like this. Uh, this is really fun. I wish there were a way to use this creature somewhere. I would love to use an Elder Brain Dragon in an adventure. Uh, but one can hope. 
I don't know if this is going to be even possible considering the rules for uh, Wild Beyond the Witchlight right now for our dungeon craft. So if there ever were the, the possibility of putting one of these in, I'm definitely going to be putting one of these in. Because it's just so cool. Elder Brain Dragon. Repeat after me. Elder Brain Dragon. So awesome. Emerald Dragons? Mm, yeah, look at that. Super fun as well. Uh, all the gem dragons are fun. Let's face it. Uh, they're so much more creative and so much more entertaining to use than, you know, the rank and file chromatics or the rank and file metallics. And what I really love about the about the Emerald Dragon, things like Mirage Arcade. This is amazing. Yeah, and of course, all of them have Psychic Staff, which is great. Everyone loves Psychic Staff. Hallucinatory Terrain here instead of Mirage Arcane, but you know, it's a matter of age and dragons being more powerful as they age, so, so yeah. Um, good, fun stuff. So, Eye Drakes are also kind of cool in that sense. Look at that. This looks like a nightmarish creature from one of those JRPGs. Right? You you can totally see this as a in, in a JRPG. This looks like the kind of stuff that you will appear in Dragon Quest or something. Um yeah, it's an aberration. It's a kind of like a beholder, uh, dragonish thing. So yeah, it's kind, it's kind of fascinating. Oh my goodness, I love this artwork. This is gorgeous, man. Completely unexpected, and this is brilliant. So yeah, great worms. Um, so more stat blocks for you to use. You want super powerful great worms. Psychic beam, pew pew. Mental space lasers. Mass TK. So this is amazing as well. Uh, super fascinating. Uh, Gem stalker. Yeah, this is not too bad. Very effective uh, for a CR5. Good, it's a good enough monstrosity, I guess. And look at all the abilities it has. So it has a good number of abilities that you can, um, that you can utilize. So you get, you get to pick. So these are, these are, Creatures like uh, that are created to hunt aberrations, according to the lore. Um, wingless dragon, I guess, kind of. Yeah, it it looks kind of weird. Yeah, but it looks it is it is pretty cool. Um, ghost dragon. I suppose this is what happens when a dragon doesn't get enough food. And becomes cranky. And their and their spirit kind of comes floating out of their mouth. No, but ghost dragons are ghost dragons are fascinating. Uh yeah, undead dragons are always fascinating. Like our resident Dracolich in the studio. <laughs> but yeah, so ghost dragon with a terrifying breath. Uh fun save, cold damage though, but the frighten is pretty fun. Uh because it also has a paralyzed rider as well. So this is really powerful. I guess CR17 is a bit much. Uh, I would say that you would probably be okay to encounter this in, in this in tier three. Uh, if it's were if it were a single a single creature. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't mind writing an entire story around a ghost dragon. I think they are a great story addition. And they are 
and you know you can really craft a story in and around the lore of a ghost dragon haunting some place or the other. So this is this is great. Port mimic. So it, this is another mimic. Uh, everyone loves mimics, and these are much much bigger mimics. Uh, much much more scary and much much more powerful. So they are kind of involved with dragon hordes. So they pretend to be a fake dragon horde, a fake pile of treasure. Uh, so they get a little bit more acidic. So they have this acid cone attack. So yeah, this is this is really fun. So much potential here. Unsuspecting adventurer too busy looking at the loot to look at their surroundings as always failing those perception checks because they dumped both intel and wisdom so no investigation no perception um vulnerable to mimics horde scarabs are great oh my goodness these are super cute look at that so these these are these are kind of cool because they blend in with coins and they kind of look like coins, um, so can do some really, really fun things with them. Uh, Scale Dust is a great ability as well. Look at that. It basically prevents a creature from turning invisible. So it's kind of like the old uh, Glitter Dust uh, effect. So yeah, so this is, this is fun. And the Swarm version is even more uh, terrifying. So this is excellent as a thematic addition to uh, a dragon horde. So perhaps if you were to run something like uh, Dragon Heist and you did come to the horde and there was and bad things had happened um, before you got your hands on the horde, maybe a swarm of horde scarabs could be involved as a thematically appropriate addition. So good to disturb your players with. Uh, yeah, so this could kind of work. Hollow Dragon, kind of undead again. And why does this look so much like Deathwing? This totally reminds me of Deathwing from World of Warcraft. But yeah, so so many cool additions, so many fun things that you could play with as a DM. My goodness. Wow. Lion Drake. Um, this totally reminds me of that. that so there's, there's this uh, Magic the Gathering card. Uh, that's a cat dragon uh Wasitora, was it Wasitora? The, the, um it's a cat dragon and the, this so so the, that's Lion Drake kind of thing. Yeah, so this is kind of cool. Uh pretty reasonable low level threat here. Uh Bone Chilling Roar, it's not it's not too bad, it's quite fun. Uh paralyzes if they fail by save of five or more. So this is not the worst. And it makes for a pretty decent low-leveled uh, monster that you could face. So if you wanted to replace, say, maybe a uh, a group of manticores with a lion drake, uh, I, I guess that kind of works as well. Uh, metallic great worm. We looked at great worms just now, so I'm gonna just skip past that. But we kind of all know what abilities they have. They are really powerful. Hey, this is kind of cute. Look at that. So this construct is kind of cool. I like the design of the construct. So it kind of looks like this, uh, I guess, fantasy fantasy robot kind of thing. Yeah, so this is pretty fun. And uh, it looks like this is one of those creatures uh, that was cre that's created by, you know, metallic dragons as a guardian. So it's kind of like a guardian robot kind of thing.
Yeah, the artwork is great. Um, and of course, the, the warbler, I guess, is the flying thing here. So yeah, interesting. Moonstone dragons. So these are the moonstone dragons. You can see how they look like as well. Moonlight Breath. I guess they will punish people in the name of the moon. Um, radiant Damage. Dream Breath. They can knock people unconscious. It's pretty cool. Kind of reminds me of the uh, the green dragon flight from a while. A little bit. Uh, Sapphire dragons. So Sapphire dragons are again, you know, one of the gem dragons. So debilitating breath here. This is an audible sound, uh, thunder damage. So this is great. So this is how they look like. Look at that. It's pretty cool. So I'm just going to scroll past really quickly. Uh, sea serpents. Yeah. So sea serpents are probably a good addition to any story that, you know, has involved seafaring, sea travel. Um, and maybe a young sea serpent could be used in uh, stories that might even be in the far north in Icewind Dale. Who knows? That might be a good addition to the story as well. CR8 after all. Um, I'm definitely thinking of adding a sea serpent to my to my repertoire of monsters for when I run Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. I think that it's certainly a lot more interesting to deal with than say uh, certain other swimming creatures. So that's something that's something I have in mind for future runs. Uh, something to think about. Even a young sea serpent is pretty huge, so it's pretty good. Uh, topaz dragons. I I was talking about them a little bit while ago just now as well. Um, look at that. Looks a little derpy uh, in terms of the facial features, uh, but it is a very cool dragon. This one. This is this is another artwork of the dragon, and this looks slightly better, I guess. But the head kind of reminds me of a seahorse, just a little bit. So yeah, so topaz dragon, uh, they can swim forty feet. So yeah, I guess a seahorse, um, seahorse isn't too much uh, of a stretch if you think about it. Um, the main thing about them is the desiccating breath. Look at that. Necrotic energy in a cone. And, you're, and, the, and the character is weakened. They also have an ability here uh, called Essential Reduction. It's a legendary action. So they disintegrate people who fail to save, basically. So yeah, so this is pretty cool, all things considered. So that's a topaz dragon, and from the looks of it, I think we've covered all the monsters in the bestiary. Just a quick look at that. So so yeah, really excited uh, on my end to look at how these creatures in the bestiary section would fit into a typical AL game. I suppose if there were thematically appropriate additions, uh, you could swap them in. And um, we're still waiting, I suppose, for more um, guidance on how we can possibly use Fizzbands in uh, Dungeon Craft Adventures for Wild Beyond the Witchlight, even though that's very unlikely. So fingers crossed, uh, we'll see what happens with that. But yeah, so Fizzbands, pretty awesome i would say uh really really liking fist bands right now and uh yeah so so fist bands as it is
So what, that's so. What do you think? I definitely want to use some of these creatures already, and I'm also very keen to get those spells and get those um, you know, get those character classes, and just jump right into a game with those characters. Yeah, I've been brewing it, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, so that was today. That was basically our our you know uh, chat and read of Brisbane's treasury on on our stream tonight, and we are definitely hoping that the books, the physical copies, get to Singapore uh, as soon as they can, so that we can start. Uh, digging through the books as well, and you know, so that more people can get their hands on fizz bands, and and we can get to see more variety, um, you know, at the table for adventures. So I think that's about it for tonight for us. And I hope that you had a great time chatting with me here, looking over fizz bands together with me, you know, doing the quick read through, all of us, um, and you know, getting familiar with the material, right? So. Do come join us again on Wednesday as we, you know, run our game stream. So on Wednesday, I will finally be getting around to playing uh, Sword and Fairy 7. So that's a Ciencia uh, action packed RPG adventure kind of thing. Very uh, Chinese fantasy uh, mythology oriented kind of story. And I'll be just giving that a try on Wednesday. Um, and on sa and on Saturday, Saturday, it's gonna be another sac another session of uh you know painting hangout with Jazian, and she's gonna be working on on getting some miniatures done. Uh, perhaps perhaps we'll get to see more of uh, what she was painting on Saturday uh, over the weekend as well, and and perhaps we'll also get to see some other creatures that might be that might be relevant to um, the current season so so who knows right and that's gonna and all our streams are gonna take place at 8 p.m uh, so Wednesday 8 p.m for our game stream and Saturday 8 p.m for uh, painting hangout with Jazian. I will probably be showcasing some of the um, some of the content that I will that I have been working on uh, a little bit more maybe next week on our next uh, TM Inspiration. And if you have any uh, any questions about running the game, about how you know you think you you think uh, you would run D and D, or if you have any any doubts about um, about the rules or whatever, feel free to drop us a note. We're happy to talk about talk about that on the stream. You know, answer some of your questions uh, about about D, D in general or about adventurous league in particular uh, happy to do that next week as well on our dm inspiration um you know segment so do come hang out with us then and um let's catch up again on wednesday so i hope you had a great time looking through fizz bands with me and uh this is jason signing off so have a good evening.